Amen. Well, good morning again. We invite you to have a seat. We're so glad that you are here, and we're glad that you are watching, too, wherever you are, whether you're driving at the lake, uh, at your home. Uh, it is exciting to be able to gather together. You notice there's a few little changes around here, some fabric in the worship center, some different decor in the lobby. This week, we are welcoming about 800 different leaders from the Canadian Alliance Church from across Canada and around the world. This is the Alliance Canada General Assembly. It happens every two years. And all the pastors, leaders, missionaries gather and share and encourage one another and talk about the future. And on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings, there's open sessions. Uh, there's some world-class speakers. You can see them behind me. The Worship Project is leading in worship. You're welcome to join us at 7 p.m. It's open, free for anyone to come. And if you're interested in what God is really doing around the world, I would encourage you to join us this week. And if you want to volunteer, there's opportunities for you to serve as well. And you can go on our website and our serve page and find out more information that's there. I've been waiting about four months to make this announcement, but next week, the upper entrance will be open. Our waterproofing project is done, and that piece of construction is finished. And so thank you for being patient. Thank you for navigating all the construction uh, that we have at this corner, it seems, and really appreciate your patience with that. We're finishing up today our series on pray. Just let us pray. What is it to be a praying church? What is it to grow in our understanding of prayer? And hopefully this has not just been cerebral and uh, mind enriching, but that has really helped you uh, to engage in prayer a bit more. And we've talked about the mystery of prayer, right? That we get to enter in to the conversation that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is having, which is kind of mind-blowing to me. We've talked about some of the frustrations in prayer that our mind wanders, or we don't always know what to say. We've talked about how puzzling prayer can be. That sometimes we use words we wouldn't normally use in conversation. That sometimes when it comes to prayer that we um, just only pray when we have an emergency or we don't really know how to connect with God. And sometimes when we get bored with prayer or don't understand prayer, we think that one of three things is wrong. That either we're praying wrong, there's something wrong with us, there's something wrong with God that he's not listening, or there's just something that doesn't work in prayer. But what if, just Go with me, what if there was one thing that would really help engage your prayer life more? What if just one thing could help open up the way and help you understand and connect with God in prayer? We've talked about some of these. We've talked about that the challenge in prayer is sometimes understanding who the one listening is, who's really listening in prayer, who the God is that hears, We've talked about the conversation of prayer, that prayer is not one way, but we talk and God listens and God speaks to us and we listen. We've, we've talked about just the need for us to change in prayer. Prayer is not just for us to get God to do our plan and our way, but it's how do we grow and change. And today we want to talk about using God's word in prayer. That God's word is God's greatest guide in prayer. That the best thing we have to help us engage in prayer is using God's word. And when you open up God's word from Genesis to Revelation, you see this is a God who listens. This is a God who speaks to us. This is a prayer book that we have a number of prayers that are recorded, that we have an understanding of how God wants us to walk through unique and challenging situations, and that often the people in Scripture, what they prayed to God was his word back to him. And when they didn't know what to pray, they'd go to the Scriptures, and they would find something to speak to him. So today we want to talk uh, about three things. We want to look at how God's word guides us in prayer, the practice of praying the Scripture, 
we want to then look at the benefits of that, what happens, and then we're going to take a little bit of time to actually do that at the end of the service. So I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 4, and we're going to look at a situation where the people practiced praying the scripture, where they didn't know what to pray, but they went to God's word, they found a passage, and they prayed that back to God. And to put this section in context, this is a few weeks after Jesus ascended into heaven. He was crucified. He rose from the dead. He then 50 days later ascended into, or 40 days later ascended into heaven. Then Pentecost came. The church started. And then the early leaders of the church began teaching people about Jesus, talking about Jesus, inviting people into a relationship with Jesus. And one day, two of the disciples, James and John, were walking through the streets of ancient Jerusalem, and they came across a man at the gate Beautiful, that was named Beautiful, who couldn't walk. And I'm always amazed at this passage because this man had been there for a long time. Certainly, Jesus, at several points in his ministry, must have walked by this man and never healed him. And I wouldn't be surprised that he felt maybe let down by God. Maybe he felt Jesus wasn't that good. Have you ever felt that? Why is God doing something someone else is like, but I feel left out. I feel like God's overlooking me. And I'm sure for a long time, this man felt overlooked until Peter and John walk by a few weeks after the church begins. They see him, they offer him nothing but the Holy Spirit, and God heals the man. He gets up, he runs, he leaves, he jumps. And people are amazed. And James and jo or Peter and John, they start talking about Jesus. People are going, how did this happen? How does this man that we've seen lying there, how does he get healed? And they're like talking about Jesus and who Jesus is and why Jesus died and what he's done. And all of a sudden, there was a great furor in the city. And because there was no other crowd control, they imprisoned Peter and John. They took them to prison and said, you're creating such a disturbance, we can't have you do that. Now, the problem was, why were they holding Peter and John in prison? And they realized they couldn't hold them because they were healing a person. So they said, we're going to release you on one condition. And this is the condition, that you not talk about Jesus again. You can't preach about Jesus. And of course, this was a problem for Peter and John, because one of the last things Jesus said to them was go into the world, make disciples, teach about me. That when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, you're going to have power to be my witnesses. The last thing Jesus said is, I want you to be my witness, share about me. And these governing authorities said, nope, you can't do that. The one thing Jesus said, you can't do. And so they go back to the church and the church and small groups are gathered, and they said, we have a problem because we're in a hard place. Jesus said for us to talk about him, but we can't, or we could be in prison. It's going to be difficult. And so what do you do? And what I love about the Bible is how real to life this is, because I wouldn't be surprised that a number of us here You've experienced the same situation. You want to talk about Jesus. Jesus has done something in your life. And yet you're in a workplace where, no, you can talk about anything else, but don't talk about Jesus. Or you're in a school. And you know that it's going to be difficult if you start talking about Jesus. Or in your home or in your family, the you, moment you start talking about church or spiritual things, you're going to get ostracized. People are going to say, nope, we don't want to hear about it. What do you do? We live in a cancel culture where some things are just not safe to talk about anymore because they're not maybe the majority opinion. And so what do you do when you can't talk about that? What do you do? And so the church was in a rock and a hard place. 
in a very difficult situation. And it would have been easy for them to do what we sometimes do. We get all irate, go on social media, blast everyone, how unfair the world is, uh, what a victim I am. Like, this is not fair. How can there be, like, justice for people? We could go on, cancel others, ask for a big change in government. All these things that we do. But the early church didn't do that. When they were in a rock and a hard place, what did they do? They prayed. And when they didn't know what to pray, they went back to the Old Testament and took some verses from Psalm 2. So I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 4. We just want to look at that prayer. Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 23, it said, When they, Peter and John, were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. You can't talk about Jesus. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. They prayed together. They banded together. And they said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. And now they go back and they quote these verses from Psalm 2. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. All these people were coming against what God wanted to do. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to continue to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So as the early church was in this very precarious situation, the first thing they did was gather and pray. Now, sometimes we're going to see in the coming weeks, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, there are moments when you need to go into a room, close the door, and you and the Father need to talk. You need to have a one-on-one -on -one with your Father. There are other times when something powerful happens when we gather with other people in prayer. There's something about two or three or more people gathered and agreeing in prayer. The Scripture says God's present in that in a unique way. And this is why our life groups are so valuable and important, because this is where we learn to pray, and something happens when we pray. A couple months ago, one of the people in our life group was going through a health challenge and was going to have to have a risky procedure that could have some very difficult circumstances in their life, and we all knew that. So shortly before they were to have the surgery, someone in our group, and it wasn't me, said, hey, can we come and can we pray for you before you go and have that procedure? And so they gathered online on our kind of WhatsApp group. Everybody gathered. I couldn't be there. I had something else to do, so I don't take any credit for this. And they just prayed. And they prayed for this person, this individual, and the procedure, and for God's protection and God's work in their life. And they ended up, closed their WhatsApp, went back to business. And the next day, the person texted and said, you don't, can't believe what God's done in my life. How God dealt with me in one particular area, not what we've been praying about. And a few days later, they texted back. They said, you wouldn't believe it. My issue is going away. The surgery has been delayed because I don't need it. And they keep getting better and better and better. And it happens sometimes. It doesn't happen sometimes. But something powerful happens when God's people pray. And if you're not part of a life group, and, and some of the groups over this series have just been learning different ways to pray, how to come to God in prayer, how to see God move in prayer. There's something about praying individually and powerfully together. But notice how they start their prayer. Here their world has fallen apart. All of these people have rose up against them 
And how do they address God? They say, sovereign Lord. These rulers, these priests, they're not sovereign over us. Culture's not sovereign over us. You, God, are sovereign over us. How we address God and how we come to him, it matters in prayer. How do we see him? They didn't see him just as kind of their friend. They didn't see him as as just a nice guy who might be able to help. They said, you're sovereign Lord. This is what we need you to do. And when they didn't know what to pray, what do you pray in that situation? They went back to Psalm 2. And in Psalm 2, this is a prayer that David prayed. This is a psalm that he wrote at a time when he had just become king in Israel. And there was all sorts of opposition against him. God had anointed him and set him as king. But there were lots of people who didn't like it and people who were coming against him. And David goes, why do people do that? Because if God's God, if he's sovereign, whatever they try to do, that's in vain. And David wasn't distracted. He didn't get angry. He didn't get upset. He just rested in God. And notice that the people here, they pray that. They're like, hey, God, you're sovereign. Lord, all these people, they're trying to oppose us. That's going to be in vain. God, we know that you're ultimately going to work. God, we understand what you are going to be able to do. God, we want to trust you. God, would you give us strength? Would you give us boldness? Would you give us courage? Would your work be visible among us? And when they didn't know what to do, they prayed God's word. There's something powerful about that. They didn't get angry, didn't get upset, they didn't criticize, they didn't call everybody names, they didn't go on social media. They said, God, would you help us? You did this once. Will you do this again in our life? And what I've discovered is the scripture, it has so many different scenarios that we face, and there's something in those that we can pray. There's something that we can understand and learn from. And many times we go to God and we go, I I just don't know what to pray. And our mind wanders and everything goes. These people, notice, they didn't have the Bible in their home. They couldn't go to a shelf and take up a Bible. They couldn't open their mobile device and, and read 20 different versions of the Bible. They had it memorized. And we have something different. We have, we have Google. We can say, hey, Google, what do I need to pray? What's a verse to pray when I'm worried? What's a verse to pray when I'm afraid? What's a verse to pray when I'm angry? What's a verse to pray when I'm betrayed? What can I pray when I'm lonely? We can go to Scripture and find verses and truths from God's Word that will guide us to be able to pray. And this changed my life as a teenager. I was uh, struggling as a teenager. I didn't always feel like I had the best friends or the best community. Sometimes that was because of my faith. And one night I was reading in the Gospel of John and I was reading there in the upper room discourse before Jesus went to the cross and before he has communion with his friends, his disciples. And and he says there this verse, it just astounded me. He said, I no longer call you my servants. I call you my, do you remember what it says? Friends. And like that just hit me. Like, is that true? Is that true, God? I'm not just your servant. I'm not just here to make life easy for you. I'm not not here to be a little soldier for you. Jesus, you're my friend. And I started praying that and claiming that friendship and approaching him as a friend. And it changed my whole approach to prayer and my whole understanding. Yes, he's God. Yes, he's powerful. Yes, Jesus is holy. But he's my friend. And something powerful happens when we go to God and we use God's word as a basis of prayer. That you read the Psalms, it speaks to almost every emotion we face. You read the Apostle Paul, talks about almost every relational challenge we face. You look at the Old Testament and the stories of the kings and prophets, and you read those, 
And it talks about many of life's situations and how God's people dealt with those. And when we read, we take those words and we turn them into prayers back to God. And when we do that, there's three, I think, three big benefits that totally realigns our prayer life. And the first benefit is just this, that it turns our prayers from control to surrender. Now, there's something powerful that happens when we pray God's word. It teaches us in prayer not to be controlling, but to surrender. Because as we said, when we pray, what are some of the problems? Some of the problems that we don't know what to pray, or we keep praying the same thing. Or I don't know about you, but as soon as I go to prayer, all of a sudden my mind thinks of my to-do list, my mind's jumbled thoughts, all these other things come in my mind. It feels like a million tigers are like jumping around in my head. It's hard to kind of focus. God's word gives us something to focus on. And it helps us focus on our posture in prayer. Because when we don't know what to pray, and when we see prayer as kind of a monologue to God, what happens? We start getting a little bossy. We start telling God what he should do. And somehow prayer becomes kind of like talking to Siri. Right? Siri, can I win the lottery so I have money? Siri, can I have this promotion? Siri, would you do this in my family? Siri, would you make my life comfortable? Siri, would you change this situation? Siri, could I have this job? Siri, could I go to this school? And all of a sudden, we're like, hey, God, can you do this? And God, can you do that? And God, if I was in control, this is how I would run the universe. And we can get pretty bossy. But notice what happens when the early church prays using Psalm 2. They stop being bossy, like, God, this is what you need to do. And they, what they do, they surrender. It moves us from control to surrender. Hey, God, how can we continue to serve you? How can we continue to share? Change us so that we're not fearful but bold. And there's something powerful in prayer when our posture changes and we stop trying to be in control and we surrender. Because most of our prayers, most of our prayers are us praying that we can control a situation so we don't have to have faith, right? Give us enough money so I don't have to trust you. Give me the job so I don't have to trust you. Give us peace in our family so we don't have to trust you. If you look at almost every prayer that we often and selfishly pray, it's so that we don't have to trust God. But you look at the Apostle Paul, for example, his prayers are not like that. His prayers are to trust more. Jesus teaches us to trust more. That was the sense of the Lord's Prayer. Give us daily bread, not monthly bread. Help me to trust you every day. Help me to build your kingdom. Help me to stay away from temptation. And in our prayer life, we sometimes wonder, why don't we see God? It's because all our prayers are for us to be in control. They're not for us to have greater faith. Because we know every time we ask for great faith, what happens? We have to step out of the boat. We have to trust God more. We have to do something. And when we open up God's word, it becomes much more of a dialogue. We're talking to God about something. God speaks to us through his word. We pray that back. God speaks to us again. God begins to shape our life. And that much of our prayer life comes when we ask God, how can I surrender to what you do. Because there's three kind of components to prayer as we pray. What does God want? What do we want? And what do we need to surrender to? Let me ask you, in the deep recesses of your heart, is your prayer life more about controlling what God should do in your life? Or are you saying, hey, God, I'm here? And this helps us, friends, to pray 
for the long haul? What's the long road in our life? What does God want to do through the rest of our life? How does God want to shape us? Because often we want God to control the situation now, not to surrender to him so that he can reshape our lives. Second thing praying the scripture does is that it moves us from praying our preferences to praying God's promises. And I don't know if you've ever gone to prayer and you prayed something and you're like, well, does God want to do that? Can I even pray for that? Is that the right thing to pray for? It's what I want, but is God going to listen? And many times, many times our uncertainty in prayer and our hesitancy in prayer is because we're not confident in what we're praying. But something shifts when we move from praying our preferences to praying the promises, what God's word has said is true. And uh, Charles Spurgeon, a great British preacher, he, he wrote this one time. He said, oh, that we would study our Bibles more. Oh, that we all did. How we could plead the promises. How often we should prevail with God when we would hold him to his word and say, fulfill his word until thy servant whereon thou hast caused me to hope. Oh, it's grand praying when our mouth is full of God's word, for there is no word that can prevail with him like his own. Spurgeon says something powerful happens when we pray back to God what God has promised and said. And Spurgeon, or Spurgeon kind of speaks of it like a lawyer, like if you're a lawyer and you're going to the judge and you're pleading a case, what are you doing? You're resting on the truth of the law. You're saying, hey, judge, this is what the law said. This person broke the law. Or, hey, judge, this is what the law says. My client didn't do that. He didn't break the law. He should be innocent. Or, judge, this is what the law says is the penalty. So this is what you should give to the, uh, to the accused. This is what the law says. You have to do what the law says. And Spurgeon is saying, we get to do the same with God. That we get to go and we get to claim his promises. God, this is what you said, and we rest on that authority. See, there's no authority in our preference. If we're like, hey, God, it'd be nice if you do this, or nice if you do that, but it's kind of nice. There's no authority, as opposed to saying, hey, God, here's what you said. Now, let me take you to another passage of Scripture where we see this plainly. If you turn your Bible to Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel, you'll remember, as a young man, was taken from Israel, and he was taken in captivity to the neighboring empire of Babylon. Israel had kind of rejected God as part of God's refining process in Israel's life. He sent them away so they could see what life is really like without God. And Daniel was one of those. As a young man, he went. And Daniel, you may remember, I mean, he was told he couldn't pray. He still prayed, and he was put in the lion's den, and he escaped the lion's den. He got to speak to kings. He got to shape the culture really there. And in, by the time we come to chapter 9, Daniel's experience in Babylon is about 67 years. It's now about 67 years have passed since the people were taken captive. And Daniel, one day, he realizes something. And we begin in verse 1 of Daniel 9. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, a descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer, pleased for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So Israel has been in captivity for 67 years. And Daniel one day gets up and he goes to his favorite coffee shop. He has his favorite cup of coffee, a pour over probably. And he's opening up some of the scrolls, the writings of the prophets. 
And he opens up the scroll of Jeremiah, who had prophesied and wrote this letter well before Israel went into captivity. And as he's reading Jeremiah, it says that Israel will only be in captivity for 70 years. 70. 67 have passed. And so what do we read that Daniel does? He gets on his knees. He says, hey, God, that's three years left. You fulfill your word. Sackcloth and ashes. I'm going to fast and pray that you are true to your promise. You said 70 years. That's three years to get us back home. Will you do it? And something powerful happens when we pray his promises. And I think the reason sometimes we find prayer unsatisfying is that we don't go far enough in our prayer. That we only go as far as our preferences. And we don't see God fulfill his promises. And that we don't see God do the fullness of things that he wants to do. See, our preference maybe is that we've got a very specific we want to do. God, could you provide this job? This is the job I want. I want this particular job. God doesn't say he'll fulfill our preferences. What's he say? He is our provider. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. We want just this job. God may want to provide a completely different job, a much better job, a different thing than what we had planned. And we get disappointed when this doesn't happen and we fail to miss what God wants to do. In fact, when I look at Scripture, there's three big, I call them 3P promises of God. That God promises three things. He promises, first, that he'll provide, that he's Jehovah Jireh, my God will provide all your needs according to his riches and glory, the Scriptures say. God will provide, that God will always be present with us, the last thing Jesus said when he ascended to heaven is, lo, I'm going to be with you always. I will be with you even to the ends of the earth. He promises his presence, and he promises his power. One of the last things he said to Peter and John, he, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive what? Power. I mean, we have an amazing God who shares his power with us. Isn't that incredible? God shares his power. And we can go to God, and we can always claim that promise. God, would you be present with us? God, would you provide exactly what we need? Help me to understand what we need. God, would you give me your power? The problem is we go with our little preferences. Oh, I like this. I want this little raise. I want to experience this. James, in the first chapter of his letter, James says one of the reasons we struggle it's because we haven't asked. James says, it's very clear. He says, you have not because you ask not. And I'm sure we look at them and think, God, I ask for a lot. I ask a lot of time. James says, you have not because you ask not. Sometimes because we ask for our little preferences, not the things God promises for what he wants to give us. And when I look at that verse, you have not because you ask not, I, I think it would be like in our day, us going on a cruise and being too cheap and thinking the food is going to cost a fortune. We can just afford the cruise, so we'll bring all our food with us. We'll bring a suitcase full of, you know, chips and granola bars and, and all that thing, and, and we stay in our room and we eat, not realizing that on the cruise, you get all the food. You get more food than you want. And often we're in our room and we're eating our Pringles when we could go to the buffet. We have not because we ask not. And there are promises of God. He will never leave us or forsake us. You can go to him and claim that. God, you will provide my need. Now, we may have to have a discussion of what's a real need, but God, you say that you will provide that. You don't leave your children forsaken. You are present with us. 
And we can go through scripture to scripture and see what God says. That praying God's word turns our prayers from demands into surrender, from preferences into praying his promises, and then finally, from comfort to growth. That a lot of times, our prayers are for us to be comfortable. In fact, I think one of the gods of our age is that we want to be comfortable. Isn't that what we say? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you have. Just be happy. I just want you happy. We want life comfortable. And most of our prayers, if you look at them, right, are for our comfort. We just want God to give us what we want so we feel good about ourselves. And again, so we don't have to trust him. But where does growth come? There's no growth when you're comfortable. You don't learn anything when you're comfortable. Peter didn't learn what it was to step out in faith when he was in the boat. It's only when we get out of our comfort zone. Paul teaches that again and again and again. And notice here in Acts, the people can't talk about Jesus. And what do they pray? Do they pray, oh, change the laws, Lord. Change it so it will be good for us. Make our life comfortable again. Like, couldn't we go back to just the old days where we had freedom? No. They said, hey, God, give us courage. Give us boldness. Give us your power. And notice what it says happened to them. In verse 31 at the end of Acts 4, it says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Were they comfortable? Not a chance. There's nothing comfortable about what was going to happen. Did they grow? Massively. They grew in courage. They grew in power. They grew seeing God at work. And sometimes we wonder, God, why aren't you there? Why can't I see you? If we're only praying about comfort, we're going to miss God. You start going to Galatians 5, verse 22, 23, where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and you say, God, give me love for people, give me patience, give me peace, you're going to grow. You turn to 1 Corinthians 13, and you talk about the love, what love is. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not proud. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You start praying that, you're going to grow. You read the story of Peter stepping out onto the water and say, God, help me. Help me to step out of the comfort of my own little boat. And you watch how you grow. And our tendency always if we're just going to pray together, is that we're going to pray to control our life, we're going to pray for our preferences, and we're going to pray for our comfort. And God's word says there's a much greater life. There's a life of surrender, of claiming God's promises that lead us to incredible growth. What do you pray? Just as we close, we're going to take a few minutes. Just I just invite us to pray about uh, just to do a little exercise. The worship team is going to come back. And I just invite us to pray just this verse or two of Psalm 91. And just kind of practice doing that. In Psalm 91, in verse 1, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And just reflect on that. There's so much to pray. Maybe just thank God that he's your fortress. Maybe to thank him that you found him trustworthy. Maybe it's a reminder to say, hey, God, I, I, I just need to, to trust you more. Help me to do that. Maybe as you read this verse, uh, you just think, I'm abiding in the wrong places. I'm drinking from the wrong well. Maybe you want to say, God, thank you that you are a true refuge because I've, I've been finding refuge in drink or a drug or porn or food or shopping or comfort. I've been running to the wrong refuge. 
So you take those two verses, and there's so much to pray for. Where is your refuge? Where is your strength? Who's your fortress? So I'm just going to give us a, a moment of quiet, and we'll keep that on the screen. And I invite you just to talk to God. What stands out from that verse? Just take a moment to talk to God about it. And sometimes with these psalms, we can just pray it as a personal prayer and we can change the pronouns. And you can say, when I dwell in the shelter of the Most High, I will rest in the shadow of the Lord. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And maybe just to make that a prayer, Father, would I be able to dwell in the shelter of the Most High? Today, help me rest in the shadow of the Lord. Help me say to you, you are my refuge and my strength, my God in whom I trust. Or maybe you know someone today who's running to the wrong refuge or who is finding shelter in the wrong arms. And maybe you wanna just pray for them and you can just say, Lord, I pray for blank whether it's John or Mary or Stephen or Carol, I pray that they dwell in the shelter of the Most High so that they will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And God, would that person come to see that the Lord is his refuge and his fortress, their God in whom they trust? Lord, sometimes I think our prayers aren't far enough. We, we may think they're pretty bold, but they really aren't. Our preferences are too small. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be men and women who find growth, not just comfort in this life, who experience a divine adventure with you, who can stand before you and claim your promises and see those come to fruition in our life, and who are able, God, to surrender to all that you have for us. Hey everyone, my name is Sawyer. I'm so glad that you joined us today. If you were impacted by this message and you have a desire to dive deeper into a church community, I would encourage you to join us in person for our full Sunday experience. We'd love to meet you at our Welcome Center and get to know who you are. And here at Bayview, our desire is for everyone, everywhere, to experience God's love. So whether you are a lifelong believer or you're kind of going through a season of doubts and questioning or you're simply curious about church, you are welcome and you are loved here. Also be sure to check out our website, bayviewglen.org, for our service times and any midweek events to join. So come be part of our community here at Bayview Glen Church. Can't wait to see you.